Um, and now it's my, my great pleasure to introduce Gail Caldwell. Uh, few people have led a more wide-ranging literary life than Ms. Caldwell. She spent over 20 years at the Boston Globe, first as a staff writer and later as chief book critic. She has taught writing courses at Boston University, has been the arts director, uh, the arts editor, excuse me, for Boston Review, and was awarded the 2001 Pulitzer Prize for Criticism for her work at the Globe. She's also penned a previous memoir about growing up in the Texas panhandle during the 50s and 60s. Uh, this love of and connection to literature was one of the many building blocks of the friendship she mourns in Let's Take the Long Way Home. Ms. Caldwell's friendship with fellow writer Caroline Knapp blossomed over their love of the outdoors, their dogs, water sports, and books, among other things. Um, Let's Take the Long Way Home describes the miracle of two such kindred spirits finding one another and the deep grief of one of the friends being taken too early and very quickly. Laura Miller of Salon.com described Ms. Caldwell's writing as serene, wry, and meditative, and the memoir was described as a gift of a book um, by the Christian Science Monitor. God, thank you for coming. I, when I, my editor told me that this was going to be a summer publication, and I said, but no one will come to readings in the summer because Cambridge is empty. So <laughs> I see I was wrong about that. And uh, I looked out when I was being introduced, and I'd started to say, how many people here knew Caroline? But I actually don't need to ask that because I know a lot of people here did and do know her work, and that means a lot to me. Um, I've thought I'm very nervous. I don't. I can't believe I'm so nervous, and I feel like this is my home bookstore. I've been coming to this bookstore for 30 years, and I've read here before. And um, I read last night in, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and knew no one, and and that was easy because I didn't know anyone. So, and they had this huge mic, and I got out there and said, I feel like I should be playing the steel guitar. So, it was a nice summer night. Um, I have. I've been tormented about what to read because this book is incredibly, for me, devastating and sad. And I also realized today as I was thinking about that, because I can't just jump into the sadness, which a lot of people um, already know about, that of course it's sad because there was so much love and so much happiness shared, which is the essence of what real devastating loss is about. So I think what I'm going to do is read the first chapter. I, because the pub date was only a couple of days ago, I'm assuming that most people have not read the book. And rather than kind of go into places that lie ahead of the story, I think I will just read what is my, my memory of um, some of the most joyous parts of my friendship with Caroline. And sorry. Um, then I'm going to read another smaller part, so. <coughs> I can still see her standing on the shore, a towel around her neck and a post-workout cigarette in her hand, half gidget and half splendid splinter, her rower's arms in defiant contrast to the awful pink bathing suit she'd found somewhere. It was the summer of 1997, and Caroline and I had decided to swap sports. I would give her swimming lessons, and she would teach me how to row. This arrangement explained why I was crouched in my closest friend's needle-thin racing shell, looking less like a rower than a drunken spider. We were on New Hampshire's Chikorowa Lake, a pristine, mile-long body of water near the White Mountains, and the only other person there to watch my exploits was our friend Tom, who was with us on vacation. Excellent, Caroline called out to me every time I made the slightest maneuver, however feeble. I was clinging to the oars with the white-knuckled grip. At 37, Caroline had been rowing for more than a decade. I was nearly nine years older, a lifelong swimmer, and figured I still had the physical wherewithal to grasp the basics of a skull upon the water. But as much as I longed to imitate Caroline, whose stroke had the precision of a metronome, I hadn't realized that sitting in the boat would feel as unstable as balancing on a floating leaf. How had I let her talk me into this? 
Novice scholars usually learn in about twice the width and weight of Caroline's Van Dusen. Later, she confessed that she couldn't wait that day to see me flip. <laughs> but poised there on water's edge, hollering instructions, she was all good cheer and steely enthusiasm. She might as well have been timing my success, fleeting as it was, with a stopwatch. With the oars my only leverage, I started listing toward the water and then froze at a precarious 60 degree angle, held there more by paralysis than by any sense of balance. Tom was belly laughing from the dock. The farther I tipped, the harder he laughed. I'm going in, I cried. No, you're not, said Caroline, her face as deadpan as a coach's in a losing season. No, you're not. Keep your hands together. Stay still. Don't look at the water. Look at your hands. Now look at me. The voice consoled and instructed long enough for me to straighten into position, and I managed five or six strokes across flat water before I went flying out of the boat and into the lake. By the time I came up, a few seconds later and ten yards out, Caroline was laughing, and I had been given a glimpse of the rapture. The three of us had gone to Chikurua for the month of August after Tom had placed an ad for a summer rental. Three riders with dogs seek house near water and trails. The result of his search was a ramshackle 19th century farmhouse that we would return to for years. Surrounded by rolling meadows, the place had everything we could have wanted. Cavernous rooms with old quilts and spinning wheels, a camp kitchen and massive stone fireplace, tall windows that looked out on the White Mountains. The lake was a few hundred yards away. Mornings and some evenings, Caroline and I would leave behind the dogs, watching from the front windows, and walk down to the water, where she rode the length of the lake and I swam its perimeter. I was the otter and she was the dragonfly, and I'd stop every so often to watch her flight, back and forth for six certain miles. Sometimes she pulled over into the marshes so that she could scrutinize my flip turns in the water. We had been friends for a couple of years by then, and we had the competitive spirit that belongs to sisters or adolescent girls. Each of us wanted whatever prowess the other possessed. The golden hues of the place and the easy days it offered, river walks and wildflowers and rhubarb pie, were far loftier than what Caroline had anticipated. She considered most vacations forced marches out of town. I was only slightly more adventurous, wishing I could parachute into summer trips without having to fret about the dog or shop for 40 pounds of produce. Both riders who lived alone, Caroline and I shared a general intractability at disrupting our routines, the daily walks at Cambridge, the exercise regimens we shared or compared, the meals and phone calls and hours of solitary work that we referred to as our little lives. Paris is overrated, Caroline liked to claim, partly to make me laugh. When she met a friend of mine one evening who was familiar with her books, he asked if she spent a lot of time in New York. Are you kidding, she said. I hardly even get to Somerville. <laughs> Wedded to the sanctity of the familiar, we made ourselves leave town just to check the vacation off the list, then return to the joys and terrors of ordinary life. I have a photograph from one of those summers at Chikorowa, framing the backs of my dog and Caroline's, Clementine and Lucille, who are silhouetted in the window seat and looking outside. It is the classic dog photo, capturing vigilance and loyalty, two tails resting side by side, two animals glued to their post. What I didn't realize for years is that in the middle distance of the picture, through the window and out to the fields beyond, you can make out the smallest of figures, an outline of Caroline and me walking down the hill. We must have been on our way to the lake, and the dogs, by now familiar with our routine, had assumed their positions. Caroline's boyfriend, Morelli, a photographer, had seen the beauty of the shot and grabbed his camera. I discovered this image the year after she died, and it has always seemed like a clue in a painting a secret garden revealed only after it is gone. 
Chikurwa itself has taken on an idyllic glow. I remember the night Caroline nearly beat Tom at arm wrestling. The mouse that sent me onto the dining room table while she howled with laughter. The best camper awards we instituted and that she always won. I have glossed over the mosquitoes the day Caroline got angry when I left her in a slower moving kayak and rode off into the fog alone. Like most memories tinged with the final chapter, mine carry a physical weight of sadness. What they never tell you about grief is that missing someone is the simple part. The two of us rode together and in tandem for five years after that first summer. We both live near the Charles River, a labyrinthine body of water that winds its way through Greater Boston for nine miles, from Upper Newton through Cambridge and into Boston Harbor, with enough curves and consistently flat water to be a mecca for rowers. Because Caroline was small in stature and could body press more than her own weight, I got to calling her Brutita, or Little Brute. The boathouses we rowed out of were a couple of miles apart, and I could recognize her stroke from a hundred yards away. I'd be there waiting for her near the Elliott Bridge or the Weeks Footbridge by Harvard, ready to ply her with questions about form and speed and where to position one's thumbs. When she went out hours ahead of me, she fired off unpunctuated emails as soon as she got home. Hurry up, the water is flat. We logged hundreds of miles together and solo from April to November. She endured my calls in those first couple of summers to discuss the mechanics of rowing. I want to talk about thrust, I would say, with insane intensity. Or, did you know the human head weighs 13 pounds? Mm-hmm, she'd answer. And soon I would hear a soft click-click in the background, evidence that she had begun a game of computer solitaire. <laughs> Her equivalent of a telephonic yawn. At the end of the day, when we walked the dogs, we compared finger and hand calluses, the battle scars of good rowing, the way teenage girls used to compare tans or charm bracelets. Because she was and always would be the better rower, I accepted her continual smugness and vowed to get even in the pool. One year for Christmas, I gave her a photograph from the 1940s of two women rowers in a double at Oxford, England. She hung it on a wall near her bed above a framed banner that read, Zeal is a Useful Fire. Both pictures hang in my bedroom now, next to the photograph of the dogs. Caroline died in early June of 2002, when she was 42, seven weeks after she was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. In the first few weeks in the hospital, when she was trying to write a will, she told me she wanted me to have her boat the old Van Dusen in which I'd learned to row and that she had cared for over the years as though it were a beloved horse. I was sitting on her hospital bed when she said it, during one of those early death talks when you know what is coming and are trying to muscle your way through. So I told her I'd take the boat only if I could follow rowing tradition and have her name painted on the bow. It would be the Caroline Knapp. No way, she said, the same light in her eyes as the day she had taught me to row. You have to call it Brutita. <laughs> I just want to read a little more. Uh, I think I have time. Before one enters this spectrum of sorrow, which changes even the color of trees, there is a blind and daringly wrong assumption that probably allows us to blunder through the days. There is a way one thinks that the show will never end, or that loss, when it comes, will be toward the end of the road, not in its middle. I was 51 when Caroline died, and by that point in life, you should have gone to enough funerals to be able to quote the verses from Ecclesiastes by heart. But the day we found out that Caroline was ill, the day the doctors used those dreaded words, we can make her more comfortable. I remember walking down the street, a bright April street glimmering with life, and saying aloud to myself with a sort of shocked innocence, you really thought you were going to get away with it, didn't you? By which I meant that I might somehow sidestep the cruelty of an intolerable loss. 
one rendered without the willful or natural exit signs of drug overdose, suicide, or old age. But no one I loved, no one I counted among the necessary pillars of life, had died suddenly, too young, full of determination not to go. No one had gotten the bad lab report, lost the hair, been told to get her affairs in order. More important, not Caroline. Not the best friend, the kid's sister, the one who had joked for years that she would bring me soup decades down the line when I was too aged and frail to cook. From the beginning, there was something intangible and even spooky between us that could make strangers mistake us as sisters or lovers and that sometimes had friends refer to us by each other's names. A year after her death, a mutual friend called out to me at Fresh Pond, the reservoir where we had walked, Caroline, then burst into tears at her mistake. The friendship must have announced its depth by its obvious affection, but also by our similarities, muted or apparent. That our life stories had wound their way toward each other on corresponding paths was part of the early connection. Finding Caroline was like placing a personal ad for an imaginary friend, then having her show up at your door funnier and better than you had conceived. Apart, we had each been frightened drunks and aspiring writers and dog lovers. Together, we became a small corporation. We had a lot of dreams, some of them silly, all part of the private code shared by people who planned to be around for the luxury of time. One was the tatting center we thought we'd open in western Massachusetts, <laughs> populated by border collies and corgis, because we'd be too old to have dogs that were big or unruly. The border collies would train the corgis, we declared, <laughs> and the corgis would be what we fondly called the purse dogs. The tatting notion came about during one of our endless conversations about whether we were living our lives correctly an ongoing dialogue that ranged from the serious, writing, solitude, loneliness, to the mundane, wasted time, the idiocies of urban life, trash TV. Oh, don't worry, I'd said to Caroline one day when she asked if I thought she spent too much time with Law & Order reruns. <laughs> Just think, if we were living 200 years ago, we'd be playing whist or tatting instead of watching television, and we'd be worrying about that. There was a long pause. What is tatting, she had asked shyly, as though the old craft were something of great importance. And so that, too, became part of the private lexicon. Tatting became the code word for the time wasters we, and probably everyone else, engage in. These were the sort of rag and bone markers that came flying back to me in a high wind of anguish when she was dying. I remember trying to explain the tatting center to someone who knew us, then realizing how absurd it sounded and breaking down. Of course, no one would understand it. Like most codes of intimacy, it resisted translation. Part of what made it funny was that it was ours alone. One of the things we loved about rowing was its near mystical beauty. The strokes cresting across the water, the shimmering quiet of the row itself. Days after her death, I dreamed that the two of us were standing together in a dark boathouse, its only light source a line of incandescent blue skulls that hung above us like a wash of constellations. In the dream, I knew she was dead, and I reached out for her and said, but you're coming back, right? She smiled but shook her head. Her face was a well of sadness. I think that's a good place to stop. Thank you, thank you, thank you all so much. Um, I have one other page that I actually love, and I, I think I want to read it only because um, I think we have time, and, and it feels like a good note to end the reading part of this on, and then I would love to hear from you because I, I think there are all, there's a lot of heart and soul in this room, and I would like to share the evening with you. Um, somebody asked me last night if 
I had a hard time finishing this book from the audience. And yeah. I said, oh my God, I had such a hard time that I wouldn't finish it. I, I, I got like nine tenths of the way through and then just walked away knowing that it was always there waiting for me and I knew how it ended but I couldn't actually write the ending because I knew when I did that it was over and I couldn't bear that um, because it, it meant that a, a certain ethereal state in which Caroline and I existed outside of time I was going to have to relinquish and I, I knew that I would have to and it reminded me of this passage because I wrote a little bit about it at the time because it was confusing to be in this narrative zone that I think every writer goes into that is beyond um, our next door to reality but in my case I would I would look at this photograph of her and say am I doing okay and I, I was I felt that this um, parallel universe that was both hauntingly sad and also that I didn't want to leave so this passage sort of takes care of that Excuse me. <clears throat> it's taken years for me to understand that dying doesn't end the story. It transforms it. Edits, rewrites, the blur and epiphany of one-way dialogue. Most of us wander in and out of one another's lives until not death, but distance does us part. Time and space and the heart's weariness are the blander executioners of human connection. I have several recurring dreams about Caroline. In one, she is living calmly in the woods in a little house of blues and greens. In another, I am typing a letter to her, and the ink keeps disappearing on the page as I write. She is always dead or dying in these dreams, but they are not awful or anguished. The reach between us always trumps the loss. And yet my one unbearable dream is the one in which she is sick and in treatment, and I cannot find her. We have lost touch or a phone has been disconnected, or my key breaks off in a locked door with her on the other side. There are many variations on this dream, the one from which I wake up clawing at space, but the message is unchanged. Life, not death, has intervened. The holiness of the heart's affections, Keats wrote, trusting in nothing but that and the imagination. And I think now that Caroline and I still something in each other letting us go out and engage in the larger world. And as certain as I am about fact and memory and the influence of each upon the other, finding the threads of all these stories has sent me into an eerie, detached insistence that she not yet be gone. I have all the detritus of life and death that argues the contrary. The potato au gratin recipe in her small, careful handwriting that falls out of a cookbook a first edition of J.R. Ackerley's My Dog Tulip that she tracked down for me one Christmas. And a mysterious CD I found in her house after she was gone, entitled Music for Caroline. It's every song from Nora Jones and Fiona Apple to Edith Piaf, a testament to the unknowable passions we all carry within. Once she referred to the core ambiguities of life as the dark side of joy, and here, these days, has been the reverse. A happy limbo in which I have brought her along on the journey. The writer's self-imposed fugue state. She has been thoroughly alive in the meadows and woods with the dogs, through each rowing lesson and argument and carefree phone call. Her death these days is somewhere down the hall, behind a closed but unlocked door. But for now, she is river tan and laughing, and pretty soon the phone will ring and one of us will say, what are you doing? And it will all begin again. Thank you, thank you for being such a wonderful audience, including Sadie, the dog in the front row. Not for years. I wrote uh, the first sentence, which is a, a page I didn't read. I read the first and wrote the first sentence, which is, um, it's an old, old story. I had a friend and we shared everything and then she died and so we shared that too. And that's all I wrote for a year. I left it lying on a blank legal pad and didn't know actually even then what I was going to do with it. 
So I think it was when I actually really began the book was five years after her death. And I, I think if I had tried to write it before then it would have been a very different book. So a long time. No, I was going to say I spent six months trying to get a uh, permission of a Neruda translation, uh, emailing Spain for six months. No, um, what is true, and I write about this in, in the book, that I, I do remember in the first year after Caroline's death that I, I thought that there would be an answer somewhere, that somewhere somebody would tell me what grief was because it was so, such a radically different experience from what I had expected. And so I remember reading Freud's Morning and Melancholia and thinking, surely this, the answer will be here. And of course, it was not at all. Um, and I, what I took great heart from actually was poetry, which will, you will understand. And um, some of the, so I've written about some of these in here. One in particular was a poem that I read at her memorial service. And I, that was really all that helped. Um, to this day, I find it surprising that I, I mean, maybe I am ill-read in, in the literature of grief. I was surprised by what I didn't know and how hungry I was looking, for, hungrily I was looking for it and didn't, didn't find it maybe anywhere but there. Somebody else asked me that last night. Lucille uh, died a year ago. She lived to the wonderful age of 14 and she was with Morelli for the next seven years. I think she did okay. Julie and I are nodding at each other. She had, she was very loved, and she was very loved by Morelli and had had always been since she was a puppy. And um, a lot of people made sure she had a as good a life as she could. So, I think she did really well. That's a publishing matter. They 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 chose only to use a uh, photograph of me. No pictures in the book, so there are actually a lot of photographs that I had great joy finding that are various places, um, including, I can't remember, the photograph of the dogs that I wrote about was taken by Morelli, and they used it actually in uh, O Magazine, where the excerpt of this ran, but there are some beautiful pictures that I found, snapshots of the two of us, um, that are on a Facebook page that Random House started, so they're out there, but they're not here. To tell you the truth, I don't know yet. I think so. I also, and I've thought about this a lot, I, I think that for years I said that I would never write about this because it was t too devastating. It, it was not something that even went into the zone of narrative for me. And then once I decided that I would, I, it, it felt like an unstoppable, sort of fully formed story. And somebody asked me, last week if it was hard, um, if it was wrenching to write it. And I, I bet a lot of writers in the room would agree that when you're writing, it, writing itself is so ubiquitous that the emotion is secondary to it, that the narrative is like a freight train. And I, and I said, no, it wasn't wrenching writing it, it was wrenching reading it. When I got proofs back from, and the last kind of copy editing sublimation experience had taken place and I read the story cold, I was, I mean, not astonished, but I think that there's a way that it, I integrated it in that process and probably still am. And I also have realized wonderfully that, I mean, I think this is one of the moment, grace notes of grief is that you find the universality of the experience and the kindness of so many people. Um, many of whom are in this room. So I have, I have found that I think there's a sort of shared lightness in for me in remembering Caroline. That is probably, I mean, the one thing Freud did do really well, he just may not have done it like a poem, was talk about internalizing the lost object. And in fact, I, I think that, I, that that is what I was able to do with this. Um, somebody asked me if, if I, it's a, a totally unanswerable question, so I'll, I'll ask it in case anybody's thinking. Somebody said, w do you think Caroline would have been happy, or, or don't you think she would have been proud about this book or something? And I said, Caroline is, you know, that's not an answerable question. What I do think is that um, there is an, an us-ness now 
Carson McCullers, I was thinking about this today, called it the we of me. And I thought, well, I've created the we of me with this book. It's like I don't have to, to – I think the worst part about grief is the ragged edges where you feel that you've lost even the love you had. You can't find the memories of – I mean, in a way, the pain is, like, preferable to, the, to forgetting. And so I, this, is, this lives outside of me now, and it feels like my, my true – Self. That's a really long-winded answer to your question. Forgive me, but I feel like, as revealing as I've been in this book, what am I going to lose? You know, <laughs> there's not much I missed. How long go, to go back rowing? Oh, or was there ever a break? no, no. In fact, rowing was was one of the, the few utter solaces that I had while she was sick and uh, after she was gone. And in fact, if people know the geography of the Charles, she was in Mount Auburn Hospital, and in the first few weeks, um, I told her one of the many laughs we had in those terrible trenches when everything becomes much brighter, and there's a lot of, everybody knows this, it's ER humor, you know. Um, I kept volunteering to go row underneath the windows at Mount Auburn and flip for her so that she could see me, you know, dis calamity on the river. Um, so I, I had her boat, and I rowed. I'm still rowing, not as eagerly, not as well as I did 10 years ago, but that's been a, a mainstay. Michelle wants to see my arms. Ooh, that's a, yeah, oh, sorry. He wants to know, if there's a moment in the book in which um, Caroline's beloved therapist and also beloved to me asked when we knew she was um, dying, and I, he said to me, I, I said, what do you think? I, it was in the last maybe week of her life. And he said, tell her everything you haven't told her. And I said, and I felt this huge relief. I remember feeling, tearing up and feeling this huge relief. And I said, there's not anything. There's not anything I haven't told her. And I meant then, it gives me, I, I meant then that I knew that she knew how much I loved her. Um, of course, what I didn't know is what I think happens to anybody who's been through, you know, it's the old story about you have a fight with your husband and walk out the door and five minutes later one of you is gone and then there's that, oh my God, I wish I had. And so of course there's all of that. It's sort of messy regret and none of it is really um, meaningful or none of it, I think probably what I said in the book to him trumps the regret. Mostly, I keep thinking that I've hauled her along with me age-wise, and I always, one of the mysteries of time, I think, I guess this is less true if you lose people when they're elderly because they're fading into that, it's a different pasture, but I keep thinking that I can't believe that I am aging and Caroline isn't. So in my mind's eye, I have her. She's like in her early 50s now, and I have her face. And sometimes I'm rowing, and I say to her out loud, oh, God, it's gotten really harder. Because <laughs> she was a great, beautiful rower, and I, I can still visualize her on the river. You want me to elaborate on the fact that grief itself was a new terrain or the that I th let me make sure I got this right. The question is that I had said that grief was not what I expected, and you want me to elaborate on that. Um, God, that's a whole other book. It's actually part of why I wrote this book. Um, Emmy asked when I started it. The I years before I started this book, I I told my agent that the only thing I wanted to write was a um, a series of essays about grief and that was years before this book in, became but evolved but I think that that desire came from how blindsided I felt by the ravages of grief I write about this a lot in the book and and what a different I think that I had very naively assumed that grief was sadness times 12 you know, that it was just great sorrow. Um, there are some people in this room who helped me enormously, I have to say, during those early. I think that uh, I remember my friend Tom saying 
grief is like being parachuted into another country and you have to learn the language and the culture and everything else on on the run um so i was i was um sobered and humbled by the the overwhelming and physical and ragged nature of it and i kept thinking i mean i'm quoting myself now i remember thinking if i could just get to sorrow i could do sorrow i mean i had this sort of romantic notion that grief was just like a lot of tears and missing somebody and not the sort of devastation that didion writes about for instance incredibly in her book um, which came out after caroline had died and i think i read that very differently from how i would have read it earlier um, and you know Emily Dickinson I mean she talks about in fact I I found um, in my old Norton's anthology we all have a musty Norton's anthology mine is at least 40 years old and I had starred things when I was a tormented teenager and I found um, that beautiful line what is I don't remember the rest of it pain has an element of blank it has no beginning or no end. And I had, this had spoken to me when I was depressed, tragic, and 16. But it meant something very different when I refound it when I was 50. Um, so I hope that's sort of an answer. Thank you. That, um, you know, so many people miss her in so many ways. And the amazing thing to me, for people who don't know this, it's actually a, a something worth knowing, legacy.com, which keeps, is where any obituary is posted. Um, there are some eternal websites that stay up because somebody has funded them. And there is still one on Caroline. And people will still write to this day and say, oh my God, I didn't know she was gone, or I only just found out and her book saved my life. And I've had the people, I have to say this, and this is not breaking, I don't mean to break confidentiality, it does, I've been in several cities talking to different kinds of people in the trade, um, in publishing and book selling, and the number of people who have come up to me in the middle of talking about everything else and said, and I got sober because of her book. Or, I mean, it's amazing, and it, and it gives me such um, happiness is the wrong word, a lot of gratification to feel like that that's been, um, I feel like I had this, I mean, everyone who knew Caroline had, and she was so beloved by people who did know her. I think that everybody has whatever their prismatic window is into her. But I felt like what I was able to do was that I had this piece of her that I was able to give back to the people who missed her work, the people who loved her as readers and missed her after she was gone. Um, for one thing, she was so goddamn funny. I mean, when I got, and you know, she was hilarious in print, but she was also hilarious in person. And I, when I got to, to write and hear her voice, rehear her voice, it was a joyous thing so I'm I'm glad I get to send a little of that back out thank you for what you said you do make me th think about oh you made me think about a lot of things but you know I think that one of the great ironies and I was thinking about this today I wrote about this a little in the book is that Caroline had um, lost her parents at a relatively early age as you know she was in her early 30s and both of them died one unexpectedly within six months of each, or 11 months of each other. Oh, Sadie. Um, and I always thought that Caroline was gonna teach me about grief. I always felt like it was one of the things that she knew a whole lot about. She was unfortunately a great, an expert in it by the time we had become friends. And I remember when she got sick and saying to her, how am I supposed to do this without you? You know, that there was this way that I, I didn't have the book. Um, anyway, that's thank you for what you said. It, well, I think it would have been raw and probably lacked a whole lot of the insight that I simply had by the cruel bitch of time. You know, I mean, I think that that time is for for 
I was thinking about this today. I was thinking about what, what, what helps, what matters when people say it will get better. And there's a part of you that doesn't want it to. You know, the time itself feels like this great intruder because then I remember the horrible feeling of, my God, it, now it had been a month since she was gone. Now it had been a year. And the longer it was, the further away she was. Um, but of course it wears you down. Time is one of the many things like death that's bigger than you are. So you just have to live through it. And I think that I got probably smarter and deeper and better able to think about a lot of this four years later. It might have just been tear stains and black blurs if I'd started it. I don't know. I, it's hard to imagine that I could have done the same job, I think. It's a great mirror for me. I mean, I think one of the reasons I wrote this book is that when the, the loved one is gone, you don't have them to tell you who you are or to be the other part of you in that relationship. And um, so it's always... Uh, any any dual memory is greatly appreciated. Thank you. There are some places in particular that I actually wouldn't go for a long time, oh, particular places at the pond where I went only with her. And then now that I do, I feel, you know, I used to, when I would row on the river, uh, Michelle asked me about rowing. I, call, I called it the Church of Caroline because I felt like it was the one place where she and I really were together. And there are places like that at the pond. But yes, I'm, I am still there. Yeah, not distancing. Um, I think that, well, in the sense that I th any sort of calamity sort of separates out the soldiers from the veterans. You know, you get a different kind of mix about the people you reach out to. I think that what happened to me was that I, I had to fling my net really far. And there were already some incredibly wonderful people in my life. and they became more important to me in the wake of her death, both because I needed them and because that space, which had been singularly filled by her, needed someone in it. So, not that I know of. I mean, maybe from time to time. Uh, the question was if I was gonna return to reviewing books. Um, I have to say, I, I I was on book leave when I left the Globe, so it's been now a few years since I was reviewing, and I have this stack of books by my bed, and I think to myself, oh, no one cares what I think about these. <laughs> and I feel like I'm getting away with something. <laughs> so if I do, it will, not, it will certainly be infrequent, but thank you for wanting me to. I appreciate that. <laughs> I don't miss the weekly deadlines of reading at midnight because I have to. I, I mean, I think this is one of the odd things about memoir, which I, uh, and particularly the closer the, the time period itself gets to the present, you're dealing with a really dicey, like, it's not like you can freeze the narrative because you know how things turn out. Um, but there was a way that, that this story drove itself. So none of it surprised me by the time it appeared. I want to thank everybody for being so attentive and dear and, and uh, for being here. Thank you.